started again. Okay, so welcome back to Rethinking, De Rethinking Debates, a mini-conference on ways that we can use tech and innovation to make debates more open, more engaging, and, and uh, more meaningful in terms of informing the public um, here at Civic Hall. Um, and we're now going to have a panel looking at the ways that um, tech platforms and debate producers can partner uh, to use technology in the course of a debate, either before, during, or afterwards. Um, we have a great panel. I, I have to, uh, I'll introduce them all. I have to apologize at the beginning, though, that Brandon Feldman, uh, who is with YouTube in charge of their news partnerships, unfortunately can't be here. His flight got grounded, his red eye got grounded in Kansas uh, and uh, with an equipment problem. And uh, so he is unfortunately not going to be able to join us. Um, we have as our moderator, Bert Herman, uh, in the middle, who is uh, uh, with uh, the founder of Hacks Hackers uh, here in New York, which is uh, a regular meetup that works to build uh, technology partnerships between journalists and techies. Um, and uh, uh, to, his, to his left, my right, uh, Lee Brenner, uh, who is with Microsoft uh, in their technology and civic engagement department, and as you'll hear from him, also has a long history uh, going back to the days of, of a platform called MySpace, which I'm sure he will uh, be glad to tell you kids all about. Um, and, and then we're also going to hear from Christine, who's gonna share uh, a case study involving uh, a partnership between Twitter and CBS, which we think was actually quite uh, uh, important as uh, showing how it's possible to pioneer, uh, even here in the United States, in the course of uh, the national primary debates. Uh, so first up, uh, I'm gonna ask Lee uh, to come up and he's gonna talk about uh, innovation in debates uh, and his experience up through uh, some stuff that Microsoft has been doing. Lee. Thank you, Mika. Um, so once again, yeah, my name is Lee Brenner. I'm with Microsoft on, the te on our technology and civic engagement team. We work on projects within the civic engagement space, so things within cities or somewhat involved with uh, Civic Hall. Uh, we work with uh, the campaigns, with news organizations, with environmental sustainability projects. Uh, so we're, we're playing in a lot of different areas that aren't necessarily traditionally about you know, selling Microsoft Office to someone. Um, but I've been personally involved in the debate space and kind of the civic engagement space for quite a while. As uh, Mika mentioned, I did used to work at MySpace. Uh, at the time, in 2007, it was, in 2008 even, it was the largest place where um, Americans and people around the world actually gathered, uh, larger than any other platform. And back in 2007, and I'm gonna go a little bit in chronological order, just to talk about uh, different things, but I'm gonna bounce around from both things that we did in experimentation, somewhat touching on things that uh, the previous panel was actually discussing, and some things that, that came very early some worked, some didn't, but there was a lot of experimentation. So one of the first things that uh, we did at MySpace, but also this was right around the time that there was the YouTube CNN, uh, that first debate that we, we talked about. We at, at MySpace at the time, I was the political director, we decided in 2007 to partner with MTV and we did these presidential dialogues. So these presidential dialogues were in, not necessarily a debate, but we had one candidate in a room, town hall format, where it was both interactive, where there were people in the room actually interacting, asking questions, but also it was one of the first major live streamed events that we did, a political event like that. It was live streamed on both MTV.com and, and on MySpace, and we built an interactive response mechanism customized for this platform uh, through a company called Flector, that MySpace had acquired way back when, but this actually touched upon what was discussed earlier, where you see on the right, there, those are the questions. So during the actual conversation, we had invited 15, at the time it was 2007, remember there were 15 people running for president, just like there were this time. We invited all of them to participate. Everybody, the leading candidate at the time on the Democratic side was a lady named Hillary Clinton. And then on the, on the uh, right side, I think it might have been Mitt Romney, I'm not sure who, was, who it was, but uh, either way, Barack Obama was in third, 
John Edwards, remember that guy? He was in second, uh, and John McCain was running you know, third or fourth at the time on the right. So we invited all the candidates. Only three agreed to do this, John Edwards, Barack Obama, and John McCain. This was way back in 2007. So what we did, again, we had one candidate in the middle of a room surrounded by uh, college students. We had multiple moderators in the room, one of which who was dedicated to this interactive portion. So as we were live streaming the event, people who were watching online were being asked questions about the answers that were given in real time from the candidates. And this, this pie chart on the right was actually dynamic, and it was on a giant screen in the room, so the candidate did see how they were being, how the audience was reacting to their conversation. The one moderator, Chris Saliza from the Washington Post, was specifically tasked to say, sorry, let me interrupt. 60% of, uh, of the audience watching online thinks that your answer is a canned answer, or isn't, is, you know, we had some, um, I think we had something that said uh, they dodged the question or was uh, uh, so something to that effect. It was a little bit more cheeky because we were MySpace. But called, the, called the, the, the senator out at the time, Senator Obama, Senator McCain, Senator Edwards, and forced them actually to, all right, let me take a step back and be on their toes and actually be able to answer the question. You can imagine in this day and age whether you know, all the candidates necessarily running now would be able to re react in that same way when they're being called out on something. And I think that goes to the question of having, potentially having multiple moderators and someone who is dedicated to that. Again, there were issues because we also had, you know, you could also see that people online were potentially gaming it and there were certain people who were, you know, from the Ron Paul folks were very active and they were able to, you could see different things going up and down. But that was something we did very early back in 2007. Uh, and I always say, as I said, kind of mentioned before, Two of the candidates went on to be the, the, the nominees when they were not running early, but they were able to, were willing to participate in something that was interactive. We then, at MySpace, partnered. We were the first official digital partner with the Commission on Presidential Debates in 2008, uh, and we built the, the sole platform uh, with the commission called mydebates.org. The idea was it was this full interactive platform where Americans come to get information about the issues that the candidates and, and their positions on certain issues could decide on how they felt about certain issues. We broke it down by gender and demographic, and it was, more, it was gamified in some sorts. So they were able to, uh, citizens were able to come, say here are the top issues, here's how I feel, and then here's how the candidates are talking about these issues. Uh, additionally, we actually, the first town hall uh, debate, or the town hall debate in 2008 and the official debates, we did ask people to submit questions, and then we did work with, um, actually, Phil's team in the back with NBC News when Tom Brokaw was presenting it. And what we ended up having to do, because we didn't actually, we decided not to have people vote on the questions because of the ability to have, um, you know, be, to be very gamed, we had a list of questions, and then we sat with the producers and said, all right, here's, you know, there's Tom Brokaw's producers, here are the questions from the internet, and let's see how we, these pepper into the flow of the, of the conversation. So in the end, it, it was still up to the editorial judgment of NBC News and, and Tom on stage, but the questions were coming from the public in that sense. Uh, 2012, just I threw this in there, I was not involved in this, but the commission did AOL, Google, and Yahoo partnerships, uh, and they did a similar learn about the issues uh, platform. And then that brings us to what I'm, I'm doing now. So uh, in, in the report, which I'm, I assume you guys have already read, there's a section about Microsoft Pulse. So uh, part of what I've been working on for the last couple of years, there is a tool called Microsoft Pulse, which is, used to be called Bing Pulse, but it is an audience response platform. So it is a, uh, a web-based uh, app during a live event, whether it's something like this in a room like this, whether it's on C people on CNN and you're doing it during the State of the Union or during a debate, you're able to respond in real time. It creates that worm that can either be put on screen or not, but it allows you to have that interactivity uh, with whatever you are watching in real time. So I'm gonna try and play this video and see if it works this time. It gives you a little bit of an overview of how CNN, has, other, CNN and others have used it uh, over the past few years. 
making history here tonight with the launch of the SR Bing Pulse. Let's take a moment to walk you through how you can have a seat at the panel. First, you need to go to bing.com slash politics on your home computer or even a handheld device. Now, you are on the panel, too. Tonight, every one of you out there can be part of our focus group by going to the webpage bing.com slash CNN. And then as the debate goes on, you can click and show us whether you dislike or agree or disagree or whatever with what's being said. And all of your inputs will help us create a graph like this showing the high points and the low points of your collective reaction. And we also want to hear from you, our audience at home. Please go to CNN's Bing Pulse website. That's bing.com slash CNN, where you can respond to tonight's conversation in real time. This is our Bing Pulse analysis of what you were most interested in last night. We tracked your reaction to our special. It breaks out responses minute by minute by Republicans Democrats and independents. Based on the few conversations I had about his going, was that he was a kind of person who just felt uh, he wasn't very political, but he viewed things in terms of fair and unfair. Here is a dream. Let us know whether you think this dream is possible. We want you to answer this simple question. We're calling it the pulse question. Who is winning the debate? So let's start with the man at the center of the controversy, Edward Snowden. Do you think he should be granted clemency? Yes. Leaving aside perhaps the harm that he has or has not done, do we like this debate that's been sparked? You get the idea. But it's been uh, used many different times. Uh, and then most recently, actually, in the Republican presidential debates, uh, we were talking about before, with many people on stage, you do see that it's very difficult to get uh, to have any sort of sometimes meaningful conversation. What CNN was able to do is have people responding, and they didn't show it actually on screen this time, but they were able to use it as analysis afterward for uh, immediate analysis for their commentators immediately afterward because of maybe so solving for that issue of everyone who's watching is gonna uh, uh, sort of agree with whatever the commentator is saying, but if we provide the commentators with the analysis of the people who are watching in real time, it actually might then drive the commentators and reverse that in some way. So um, I'll play a second video really quick just because it shows that analysis as well, if that's cool. Let's see if that works. Well, throughout tonight's debate, we collected feedback from voters on what the candidates themselves were saying. There were some real hits and some big misses as well. CNN senior political correspondent Brianna Keeler joins us now with that. Brianna? Hi there, Anderson. CNN conducted a national online dial test with Bing polls tonight. And specifically, we wanted to look at when self-labeled Republicans and independents, you see Republicans here in red, independents in purple, very key in this primary season. We wanted to see when they agreed or disagreed with what they heard in the debate. And there was one moment in particular that really registered positively with them. This was how Carly Fiorina handled this question from Jake Tapper. You can see it got very hard, uh, high marks here as she responded. Last week in Rolling Stone magazine, Donald Trump said the following about you, quote, look at that face. Would anyone vote for that? Can you imagine that, the face of our next president? Mr. Trump later said he was talking about your persona not your appearance. Please feel free to respond what you think about his persona. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to me, Mr. Trump said that he heard Mr. Bush very clearly and what Mr. Bush said. I think women all over this country heard very clearly what Mr. Trump said. Uh, so you're actually see, able to see the graph move and one answer to what was discussed before is when, we, when we're working with the news organizations, we specifically figure out how, what the time delay is from when people are watching it, making sure that when, as people are watching on air, they're not necessarily voting. They're watching, they're voting, but then the, the line actually shows up at the correct moment because especially when we do it afterward and we tie those together. So people aren't necessarily, if they see it going up, they're not gonna see it in the same, I mean, there's still a slight delay so they're not necessarily responding and saying, oh, everyone's going up, so I'm going to vote up too because of the fact that there, um, there, there is that delay and it's, it's built in properly. Uh, it's been used, again, in, in the UK. Uh, we'll, the next debate is going to talk about this, and I think someone's from uh, Silicon Harlem, but we did use it in a local debate here in New York um, up in Charlie Rangel's district. They used it up in a, a technology debate. 
again, there were some issues with it, and again, this was in, in, in the discussion as well. One of the things often with any sort of technology is, and especially nowadays, you need to have the technology working, right? And it needs to, um, or the Wi-Fi, which was one of the issues here, uh, needs to be strong enough when you have people in a room, especially uh, responding all on a platform. But that's the case of it, and of course, we've all been to conferences where that happens in this day and age where everyone, it's known that everyone's gonna be using uh, Wi-Fi, still, there's never enough. Uh, and then I'll go to what at least has been announced what this year, what you're going to start seeing uh, with the big debates that everyone's paying attention to. Uh, at Microsoft, we're, we're partnering with PBS NewsHour uh, to create a platform called WatchTheDebates.org. It is launching, uh, I promise, before the first debate. I won't tell you exactly when. Uh, but it has been announced by the commission uh, as one of the, one of the platforms that they're, they're working on, the technology platforms. Uh, you'll see that Facebook and Google are doing things with some, asking some questions potentially. Snapchat's gonna be on the ground. But what we're doing is trying to create an archive of all presidential debates from 1960 onward, all in one place. There's never been really done before. We've also, PBS NewsHour has created uh, video highlights of different issues and how it's been discussed over the time. And all of these videos can be uh, pulsed so you can go back and actually you now see that worm on Kennedy versus Nixon. Right, how it would work, how it would have worked, and so you can look back and actually uh, react to all those different uh, issues and uh, and the debates from throughout the years, and see how how basically the format has changed and other things as well. So that's that's all I got in terms of the presentation. Um, do you want to do this now, or do you want to? Okay, let me see if I can pull. Do you want to maybe show it? Or do you want to talk? Candidate invoked 9 11 to justify millions of Wall Street donations until now. The idea being that, yes, you were a champion of the community after 9 11, but what does that have to do with taking big donations? Well, I'm sorry that whoever tweeted that uh, had that impression because I worked closely with New Yorkers after 9-11 for my entire first term to rebuild. And so, yes, I did know people. I've had a lot of folks who give me donations from all kinds of backgrounds say, I don't agree with you on everything, but I like what you do. I like how you stand up. I'm going to support you. And I think that is absolutely appropriate. Well, I, I, if I might, I, I think the issue She's this one. Okay. Oh. <laughs> See, gonna, now, if you I'd, had I'd the worm on there, right now, right. everyone would be like, whoa, they're the babies. Um, to make a shot close this? Okay. Um, so, sorry, that jumped right into the tweet that, that I wanted to share with you. Um, and based on my track record of showing videos, I wasn't going to stop it when it did. Um, but with that moment, what, what you saw there was the first time after 50 plus years of debates where someone talked back. And of course it could be argued that we've been talking back for a while, right? We talk back at our television screen, we talk with each other, but actually getting through that moment where something that someone who was watching the debate felt wanted to react to, and that reaction coming out during the debate, this was the first time for this to happen in the United States. And just to give some background on this, and this is based on an interview that I did um, with, with Adam Sharp, who's the head of news, government, and elections at Twitter. Um, in terms of putting this together, well, first, his, his reaction, or his quote about it was, for 55 years, we've all been yelling at the screens in presidential debates. This is the first time that the screen talked back. But to get to that moment of where it talked back, you have to understand a little bit of the background with the process. CBS had hosted the first ever televised debate in 1960, and they teamed up with Twitter for the event at Drake University. And this marked the first time that Twitter was an official partner in a US debate. They had advised other networks, but this was the first time it was, it was them and CBS going into this one together. 
And they had started working together in tandem over the summer. So months before this November 14th debate took place uh, where that tweet came out. And they were testing a curation methods during the network's other debates and building on ways that Twitter had been used in previous election cycles in other countries. And past debates, for example, might have included a counter showing the number of tweets per minute. Uh, but this time around, viewers saw graphics cycling through the volume of conversation as well as each candidate's share of the conversation. So they were really breaking down that data and presenting it in real time. Visuals also captured the top topics that people were tweeting about and debate moments that drove the conversation. And Twitter collaborated with Pistano, a social visualization measurement platform, to display data on a huge digital video wall in the spin room. And then using Curator, which was a tool that Twitter um, had rolled out earlier in the year to help media publishers search, filter, and curate tweets for their own display on web or mobile, CBS producers could select and display a scrolling timeline of tweets that ran alongside the candidates during the debate. And that's where it all started, he said. That's where the data started telling the story. They knew that they were going to pull something that night, but they didn't know what it was, and they were all in anticipation waiting for that moment. So as the debate was happening, producers saw a spike around Clinton's comment linking the Wall Street campaign contributions to her work as a senator helping to rebuild downtown Manhattan after 9-11. Sharp said CBS used Curator as well as TweetDeck, excuse me, and Twitter itself to gather perspective on how Twitter users were reacting. And upon noticing that a number of the tweets were highly critical, the search was on for a tweet that would represent the consensus that was forming. So that was interesting too, was that they saw the moment, they saw this bubbling up in some way, and then they said, okay, we're gonna use this topic, but now we need to find the right tweet, we need to find the right person to, to present this. And that's when a comment by University of Iowa law professor Andy Grewal surfaced. And that's the one that you saw up on the screen that says, I couldn't believe um, uh, of the critique about that. And he later told the Des Moines Register, I couldn't believe the tone deafness. I felt compelled to make an actual critical remark. So just so you know, he was not particularly popular on Twitter and at the time, and I mean that is no offense to him, but he had 200 followers. Um, and when producers, when producers found the tweet, by the end of that night, he had a few thousand, I think. It had built up quite a bit. Um, so it wasn't the most retweeted tweet when they found it um, and when it got CBS's attention. But being an Iowa voter helped. That was one thing I think that they were looking for as well. This debate was taking place in Iowa, so you had someone local who was responding. And the fact that it came from an independent voter, added Sharp, in Iowa City, in his pajamas, who had never live tweeted an event before. They didn't know he was in his pajamas. They don't know that much about you yet. Um, but that was what they found out afterwards. He, Adam said, you know, really just highlights, I think, the potential moving forward. So before submitting the comment for air, before getting it to the moderators, and before having it put to Hillary Clinton, CBS producers had to quickly vet Grewal. And they spent eight minutes doing this. They had to verify his bio, and they had to review his past tweets for any sign that he might be working for another campaign. And he was someone whose bio was there on Twitter. They identified him as a law professor. They were able, to, I'm sure, to go to the university's website, see that he was. So things could be done really quickly. But it also shows the limitations of technology, where you had the algorithms and you had the data streams that were going where you could see what the topics were. But to actually pick that one individual, you needed an editor. You know, you needed a producer, you needed someone who understood that you still, in producing these debates, need to be as fair and balanced as possible. And otherwise, they were going to be in big trouble and have egg on their face if the first time that they did this was gonna be someone that was shown then to have a background that would have made him biased in, in putting it there. And that's what Adam spoke to um, when I talked to him about it, saying, when he said, that's where it gets important to have both that algorithmic layer and that human editorial judgment par paired together, but neither can exist without the other. The reality is, with many millions of tweets about one of these primary debates, a human without help from the algorithm would drown under the volume. The key is, how do you get them at least to that right part of the haystack so they can start poking around a little bit more? And that goes back to the curation tools that they had set up for that night. So I'm gonna leave it there, um, other than to say that when they put the tweet out there, conversation had already moved on to something else. I think they were talking about gun control at the time. So by bringing that tweet in, it changed not only the conversation at the debate then, but I think it gave a lot more validity to the post-debate conversations that continued around the critique of Clinton um, and the, the funds that, that she had received. So I think in some ways it really was a changer and we'll see if it, we can get from eight minutes to eight seconds or if anything else could be done. Thank you very much.
Hi. So with that, let's dive into some uh, panel discussion between you both. Maybe you should grab these mics here. Yeah. Make sure this is all working. So with all these partnerships, I mean, clearly the tech companies also have something to gain, right? They're getting their name mentioned on major television networks and in stories about it later. And I'm just wondering about these relationships exactly. And uh, what is the relationship? I mean, what is the transparency that we should know about? Is there agreements to pay for anything? The technology is providing being provided for free. Like, how how should we look at these relationships? We look at them as at a critic with a critical eye. We haven't done research around that with this project, but one of the things that we were intrigued by and why we wanted to see what other countries were doing around using technology and social media was how often we see these partnerships promoted and shown on air constantly, like during a debate and the run up to the debate. And then it seems like nothing really different happens. Like we're still watching the same debate. So from a viewer's perspective, it looks to be a lot about branding, um, a lot about promotion, um, a lot about getting the tech companies' uh, names out there. But I think the impact has been relatively very, very small. And when I say impact, I mean the impact in terms of changing the debate has been very small in compared to the amount of, of promotion that, that is done and advertising that's done around that. Yeah, and I would ask Lee about this too, because I just noticed, it made me think of this when you said, oh, it used to be Bing, but now it's Microsoft. I mean, obviously, clearly there's branding interests here and in why you're involved, right? Uh, absolutely. From, from that perspective, I mean, well, the, the change in that name was more of an internal decision. But, uh, but there's absolutely branding considerations when, these, when all of these companies are being involved. Um, you know, part of it is, yes, uh, you know, I work on a civic engagement team, and we're not... We're not um, directly selling certain thing, you know, products. Uh, we work with obviously those teams that are, but a lot of it is one for the, for the goal of being involved in the civic space, but also there's something about uh, the branding involved. You know, and, and for debates like when the, the brand is in the title of the debate, CBS, Twitter, there is absolutely, it's about branding and there's money. It it most does often money, being, money does change hands. Listen, so I, I don't know exactly for that one. I'm not gonna speak about that, but I know it, ha it has happened on other, on a lot of these debates, the reality is news organizations are making a lot of money during these debates. Uh, they also cost a lot of money to put on these debates, right? Uh, there's huge spaces um, and there's huge productions. So there's that part of it is, as well. Plus, I think there's the interest of having um, some sort of interactivity involved. And, you know, there's a reason probably it's not called the, the CBS, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat debate. Twitter wanted to make sure that it, I'm sure that they were the only, uh, you know, social media brand involved, and they, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm not, you know, I don't know exactly, but I'm sure there was uh, some sort of exchange. Um, but you know, that that's, I think people need to understand that. I mean, there's, it's, it's they're both they're both commercial entities, right? It's not like, it's not like, um, you know, Twitter's a media company too, the same way that CB, in, in, same way that CBS and all these places are now become are all in, intertwined in some way. Right, but I, I, I guess just going towards the issue of transparency, obviously, for example, with Facebook and the whole debate over the trending topics and humans were actually involved when people thought it was an algorithm and was there bias there. I mean, these, these are private companies. Their code is not open source. We can't actually look at the algorithms to see if there is something going into that or maybe humans are tweaking the algorithm to make it better. I mean, what uh, I'm wondering how, how we see that as something that should happen or what what should the audience know about the actual technology that is fueling this? That's a great question. Um, and you know, when I said before that we don't see a lot different in the debates, I think with some of these partnerships, you know, Facebook uh, primarily, um, that there is still the data that's being given to the moderators. So even if, even if when the moderators say, and it was tens of thousands of questions we got in and a million comments and all, and then like you get two and they don't say anything different, but Facebook is still behind the scenes of gathering the data of what are the top things being discussed um, in this region amongst this demographic and supposedly the moderators are making some decisions in their questioning based on, on that information. Now on the one hand, 
I feel like I'm, you know, it's a double-sided thing. We want moderators to be gathering information of what is important to people and using that then in their questions to the candidates. But you're right, there's not a transparency in, under, in understanding where that comes from. It's not like a saying, well, here's a poll and here's what people said were the top three issues. Um, but rather, we just get sort of the generalized, you know, and, and this, is, this is the information that, that we're getting in. Um, so it'd be interesting to see a breakdown of that. And I, and I think, um, Lee, so this is something I just wanted to follow up with what, what you had said. I, there was a partnership with MySpace and the Commission on Presidential Debates. I did not know that. Like, I never would have thought, you know, that that was. But I'm curious why the Commission on Presidential Debates has partners. Well, so I, it's actually, so in 2007 and eight, when we were first having those conversations, I know that they had had conversations with a lot of different news organizations, or, uh, media, new media organizations at the time, it was called New Media, uh, where they were trying to figure out, all the way back then, uh, and there were, you know, Meek and others were, were involved in this back then too, and pressuring the commission to say, look, this is the new wave, everyone's, this is where the people are, you need to have it, that there needs to be some sort of involvement. Uh, so the commission, I know they've been grappling with that idea all the way through this cycle as well. Uh, their perspective is, partially because of what we were just talking about, they're the place where, look, you can't put your brand on screen, right? It says the Commission on Presidential Debates, it will not, and part of the discussions, and, and I'll say this when I was at MySpace, that we had with the commission was, we didn't request that MySpace be up on, on stage. Other, other companies did. And so that's, in the end, part of the reason that I was told that we ended up uh, getting the partnership at the time was because of that. And we said, look, Maybe we'll MySpace would have done better if you had pushed for the <laughs> brand to be there. There are plenty of, plenty of other reasons there. Uh, but, but, I but I also think it goes to, you know, we also recognize, you know, people are gonna come to the platform and it said MySpace, it said powered by MySpace, right? And that's where it was seen. But there was, at the time, there was also less of a um, civic tech mentality in a lot of these companies at the time. Like it was just getting started and Twitter did, was just starting. They, were no, they weren't even at the point where they would think about doing that. Um, and so it was less of a, of a commercial mentality at the time. Right. But I guess for, for this, this cycle, we have for the first time ever, Facebook is partnered with the commission to actually potentially provide questions to the moderators. I mean, and that they say it's up to them whether they use it or not, but I guess that's the first time that this is actually directly feeding well, no, into We did debate. it in 2008. You did do it, yeah. okay. I, I, we, we did do it, but as I said, we, we uh, you know, the technology wasn't the same. We actually just, we sub the people submitted questions uh, and then we just handed a list basically of questions, right? Because we didn't do any sort of uh, voting or anything like that. It was eight years ago, so we did do it, but I think now it's gonna be a little bit, you know, obviously broader I think supposedly Google and Facebook are somehow involved in that as well. And basically the platform will be, and, and then, but from what I understand, just having pay, paid attention, so the commission did a partnership with us directly in, to build that platform in 2008. In 2012, they did a partnership with Yahoo, AOL, and Google to build the platform collectively. This year, they're not necessarily doing just one partnership. They're doing, they're, they're allowing everyone to participate in different ways. Um, and I think they haven't necessarily agreed the commission doesn't decide on the question or what questions are asked anyway. So it may just, be they're, they're saying, well, you can provide these to the moderator. It's up to the moderator to decide if they want to use them. All right. So kind of looking forward to the next election, I guess, you know, technology is evolving incredibly rapidly, particularly machine learning is having this amazing moment where potentially, I mean, you spoke, Christine, that that Adam Sharp from Twitter said you need human editors to sift through all this stuff, but actually, I mean, coming soon, maybe you don't need human editors to sift through all this stuff. You know, maybe computers can do real-time fact-checking immediately in real time, so we don't have the the criticism like we saw with Matt Lauer and the uh, the Commander-in-Chief forum, right, where he was not doing fact-checking and just kind of let people say what they wanted to. So I wonder, I mean, are, are we going to a day where that that will become a reality? How will that affect things? Will we not even have moderators? Some people have said you should just have a timer on stage and let people go at it. So wh where are we going with all this? That's anyone's guess. Um, in terms of having a, a moderator and not having a moderator, I'm, again, sort of two sides with this. I, I see 
for a certain type of debate, and I think this would go back to the things that David Birdsell would say, right? Like, what kind of debate do you want to have? What is it that you want to get out of it? Not having a moderator might be an excellent thing, you know, of having a conversation continue. Um, in other ways, though, I think, especially when you're taking questions uh, from the public, um, that having someone who has a really good, solid, deep knowledge of an issue can often be very helpful of ensuring that that question is answered thoroughly and is there's some probing afterwards. Um, one of the other case studies that we did, and, and there's someone here from Open Debate Coalition, Lilia, who'll maybe speak more to this later, um, but they, they had two moderators for a debate where all the questions were taken from the public. All of them. So it was, it was a platform that was put up, and similar to what was done in Taiwan in some ways, people submitted questions, they were voted on, and from among the top questions, the moderators then made selection of what questions to ask. But one of the moderators in particular was, was very, very good about knowing the issues. And I think that that was a very helpful thing to see. So going back to your original question of the tech and the, the, you know, the people involved, um, I'm, I'm not ready to throw out the people yet. You know, I think there, uh, there's, there's a lot of value in that. Um, but again, under different circumstances, different formats, you could see how things get tweaked you know, for what needs to be done. And I, and I don't think that there's going to be one solution, right? There, there are, look, we have this election season, there's a reason we've had so many different forums and debates. Part of that, frankly, is just, it's a commercial reason and people are making a lot of money with all these things and there are people are watching them. But there are all these different formats and you also might be able to get to uh, understanding about the candidates from different angles based on these different things. Like, if, you know, using t Twitter as an example, probably everyone here has a Twitter account, but most Americans are not gonna sit there during a debate and tweet, right? And even most people that are on Twitter aren't gonna do it. There's gonna be a select group of people that are doing it, and it's a closed, that is a closed forum, right? You have to have an account in order to participate, and you have to be willing to say, I wanna say something, and then you wanna put it out there. So there's, there are steps involved with that. Um, but it's good for, for you know, one aspect of looking at it from that, from that critical eye. Same way with, with Pulse or any of the, the dial tests, you know, unless you have a specific set of 20 people in a room that you know are independent and have declared it, it's, uh, it could be a much broader use. It could potentially be gamed in certain ways. It's not necessarily an exact poll data r responses, but there is value in it in some aspect. You can see like how the collective in aggregate felt. You know, that people, you can argue whether, you know, once you get to enough people of 100,000 people, you're gonna have about the same amount of responses, similar responses that if you had 20 people in the audience, right? Uh, but I would, I would just say that there's gonna be, the good thing about it is that at least people are experimenting. To what you said about um, using essentially what's like the worm you know, future in, in that reaction all to it, I can, I can see what the interest is and, and all and, and, and some of the benefits with it. I think one of the problems is when the media end up using that data then at the end that's gathered that is so unscientific. You know, you don't know who, how many people, you know, who's using it. I mean, I don't want to, you know, like name names, but I might know someone who kind of sat through a debate that they were really angry at a few of the candidates and, you know, it's like, nah. <laughs> um, I just can't stand what's being said right now. Um, but it may be for, for other candidates. But um, the, the point being is that I think it's, it's fine. I think it's, it can be engaging to some extent, but I don't think it's something that then media afterwards can say, and, you know, 56% of the public tonight said this or made this decision, you know, or, or feels this way about something. And I think that we're using things that are sort of gamey in, in that way, and then using that as data, and I think that's problematic. And especially when, when we heard earlier that just the commentary afterwards by the media biases people, right? So, okay, surely then, what, what, how does that bias people when in real time they see the, the worm going up and down? Oh, most people like that thing, but I thought that was totally off, like, but. Yeah. And we actually, at, at when we were designing Pulse, we got actually a response from some of the, you know, I think it was from CNN, they said, look, you know, we want to try one where the audience doesn't see it, right? Even on their phones, they were not seeing it. So all they were seeing was basically the buttons or the dial so that they didn't see it on screen and they were just at home and seeing the, the, basically the buttons agree or disagree. So they weren't ideally being influenced by that makes more sense. the, 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 the um, worm. And then that's how, then they married it even when, when Brianna Keeler was doing that analysis, that actually married the lines just in the studio, or in the production studio, 
Uh, so they put it into the video afterwards. They were able to use it afterward, but the people actually voting didn't actually see the line, so they were just doing it in that sense. And I think also just one of the things we've seen, like with a, with a worm version or the dial test, comparatively to potentially using a social network where there might be other distractions, the advantage to that is that the only thing that they have to pay attention to is what's being said, right? And it actually, you're, you're responding very simply, agree or disagree with what's being said. You're not agreeing or disagreeing or sending out a tweet or putting out a post, and then frankly, I mean, everyone knows this, you go on a Twitter or you, or you do something, you're not gonna go right back and stop playing on Twitter. You're gonna say like, oh wait, what did Kardashian just say? You know, you're like, you're off and then you're not, you're not paying attention. And you might still have it on and, you, and, and to the argument before, you know, many people can multitask better now than ever before, but yes, your attention span might be less. And that's part of what commission has always said is like, these are the debates, everyone's paying attention. Most people are paying attention for the first time, surprisingly, uh, to, this, to this election. And so we want people solely just looking and not necessarily being distracted. Okay, well, let's open this up to people here. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Okay, they're in the back, and I don't know if we have another microphone or somebody can get you one. Yeah. I have two questions, if I may. Uh, Christine and Lee, uh, in terms of, you talked about audience reaction, and David brought it up, I'm sorry, he's not here for the post-debate discussion. What about, I think as we've all seen in this political cycle, the stage and the audience have actually played a role as well in influencing people, reaction to the questions and how the audience has reacted, et cetera. Do you have any data that supports any of the results being influenced by that? And then the second thing, Christine, I'll come back to you. Credibility of the moderator is the most critical thing we worry about when producing debates. And yes, it took CBS eight minutes to vet, which I applaud them, that's pretty quick. What would you suggest as a way of being certain that the question you're asking has indeed been properly vetted so it doesn't come back and bite you as it did CNN in the last cycle when they found out that one of the questions was actually planted by a campaign worker? Uh, well, in terms of data, we, I don't necessarily have any specific data on whether uh, the influence one way or the other, but we just anecdotally, just from the, some of the news organizations, again, you know that they're, they also have to fill a lot of time. There's part of that afterward. Uh, but they also, so there's value in at least saying, instead of it's just, in the end, it's just opinions of six people, but at least you can say, here's, here's what our audience felt collectively, um, you know, each individual news organization can see how many votes came in and how many people participated so that they are able to say, all right, if it was only 10, maybe there's less value in that, but they can make an editorial judgment on, all right, we had 25,000 people participate, there might be value in I talking think about that. your question was about actually the audience in the room, right? And like, okay. I always remember like Jim Lehrer, you know, always tells people don't talk, you know, don't react. I remember, you know, starts every debate like that. Yeah, is there any evidence about that? And I guess could technology play a role in removing that from the equation? Meaning, meaning whether the people in the room watching? I saw the Annenberg study that was done. One of the recommendations that the group came back uh, was that audiences not be part of any of the debates just for the fact of role. Uh, I was at a debate earlier this year where, the, where pretty much between the stage and there were 10 or 11 candidates, I'm forgetting how many, and the audience were completely out of control and you can't tell me that didn't influence the, out, the out output of this debate. No, I mean, I, absolutely there's gonna be a crowd mentality and when you hear people applauding, it's gonna sound, and that's gonna change the dynamic of what happens on stage and the candidates. I don't have any specific data on that, I think, um, but there is value in even the, when the commission, when the, these official debates, the crowd is silent. Well, we'll see how it works, but they're supposed to be silent. Right. In, the, in the past, they're usually silent, right? But, and, and specifically probably for that reason, so it's just focused on there and the spotlight's there. Conceptually, you could have everyone silent and maybe there's the, maybe they're using a dial test or something and it's just, that that's their response, and you can see it in that sense. Uh, but I think there, you're, I think there is value in having, um, especially when 
the, it's the, the key debates. I mean, a lot of the primary debates, a lot of it was just, enter a lot of it was entertainment, right? And after seven or eight, I mean, you're not necessarily, even if there was silence in the room, you're not necessarily learning anything new, right? Um, and the people that are mostly paying attention to those debates probably watched the first debate and the second debate and the third debate. And that's why, frankly, that's why the, the debates coming up are so important because most people didn't pay attention to the primary debates. And I remember during the, the primary debates, one, one of the moderators, I'm, I'm sorry I'm forgetting who it was, it might have been John Dickerson, but I'm not, I'm not positive, um, said after one of the Republican uh, primary debates that the RNC was wanting people to get excited in the room, you know, kind of goading them at them to, like, to, to be part of that. And so I think that is very influential you know, when you have an audience like that. Um, I also think, though, that we've come to expect that to some extent, you know, of like watching reality television shows where someone's getting voted off or, you know, the crowd is voting and all, you know, and it's like you're used to like seeing people on stage and the cameras spin around and then they go to the audience and they go, and the primary debates didn't feel all that different from that after a while, um, you know, especially some of them. Um, so I, I think it's, it is certainly influential when, you, when you've got the voices that are there. Um, Back to your other question, I think. I think we can all agree that reality TV has crossed over now this election. Oh, yeah, that happened. <laughs> that definitely happened. Um, and you were, you were also asking then about the moderators and how they might be vetted. Is, am I? Right. Sure. Right. And I think maybe one of the workarounds to that was we, what we saw with, um, it was another Democratic primary debate earlier this year that uh, PBS NewsHour hosted in Wisconsin. And a few weeks prior to that debate, they put out a call on Facebook, um, one of the political uh, producers of the show, um, inviting people to join a closed Facebook group that PBS was putting together in advance of the debate, where people would start talking about the election issues, about the candidates, and then from that, they might take some of the questions and the issues that were being discussed and use that during the debate. And they did that. And then during breaks in the debate, they would go back to the, the uh, people who are in the group and check in with them. And at this point, just five minutes before the debate, they opened it up to the public so other people could see then the conversation taking place in that group. But that they returned to them and then sought their input on follow-up questions. And what was good about that was that prior to, to joining the group, there was a questionnaire that was sent out. The producers talked to some of the people by Skype or even by phone. So they got to know them. And then people, I think, were you know, very forthcoming and honest in the discussions, and it was a good group, and it was very cordial. But in that case, then, you had a built-in group of voters who you could turn to who had already been vetted and ask them to, uh, again, give some more you know, input or reaction you know, to things that were taking place during the debate. So maybe that's what you do, you know? And, and, and that it doesn't all have to come in a spontaneous way of going, oh, that one, okay, find out who he is. But instead, okay, here's these 75 people that we already know and trust in some way, and let's engage with them. And I think the level of engagement with them and, and including their questions that night was high above the rest. So there are questions, is it right here? Hi, my name is, uh, my name is Alistair Chang. I was just wondering, I had a question for Lee. I'm not sure how far your time at Microsoft goes back, but I was curious um, if you knew anything about the choice to sort of specifically focus on Pulse as a project. I'm not sure whether you were sort of, you guys sat back and said, you know, how can we get involved in this space? So I, I've been there two years and I, I came to Pulse, it was already created, um, but as part of my uh, talking about it, I, I do know at least what I was told, <laughs> the, the uh, implementation came after the, um, I think the 2014 election uh, and the team was looking at it, uh, looking at television. They were something to the effect of watching, and they were getting upset with something they were watching. And they said, "Well, why don't we? What if we created a dial test that allowed anybody to use a mobile platform?" And they very quickly, right after the election, from the election to 
uh, State of the Union. I think they went to Fox News at the time. So within two, three months, they built a prototype and uh, put a team of engineers on it. So let's just try to create something that would allow that to happen. So then the f uh, 2014, 2015 uh, State of the Union, Fox News used this brand new technology um, and ended up getting, I think, a, a, you know, 10 million votes. It wasn't 10 million voters, because you can obviously respond multiple times, but a lot of people were just interacting. I mean, you can imagine the people that were watching the State of the Union on Fox News, you know, it's anecdotal, but all cable news is much older. Fox is probably older than, than even most. Um, but to be able to have a platform that had a, an easy technology platform that allowed people to, to interact, they saw it as a, uh, a way for Fox and then others to, to have at least an audience engagement tool. And I think that's also another perspective from the news organizations. They also want the engagement of their audience. So they're not, you know, as much as they want people just to be sitting there and watching the TV, most people have it on and aren't necessarily watching, right? They just have it on in the background. The more they can have people engaging and paying attention and watching instead of three minutes, they're watching for four minutes, that increases revenues and everything else. So there's a reason to have um, some sort of technology, whatever it is, for that news organizations to have people interacting and it increases the amount of time that they pay attention to what's on the screen. Another question there in back? Hi there. Yes, uh, I'm Benjamin Singer from Mayday.us. And one thing that I and we were really excited about with the open debates was the possibility for scaling debates uh, you could say down or out from the presidential debate, the opportunity for down ballot races to benefit from open debate since they already receive so little media coverage. Um, so are there plans or obstacles uh, to expand uh, some of these efforts and more of these efforts into down ballot races? Well. I think Lilia can definitely speak to, to that more uh, in, the, in the next panel and talking about Open Debate Coalition and how that might be working. Um, I know that just this project was initially started where we were looking really just at global, but then there were some interesting things happening on the national level, such as the Twitter example, you know, that led us to then do some coverage there. Um, and then that sort of trickled down <laughs> to looking more at state and local because we were, taken back by how much de debates are going on and are happening right now. And you still have the challenges of incumbents not necessarily wanting to do debates because they don't want to give the platform to the challenger. Um, you've got issues in places of literally of, of internet access still. I mean, there was a place in, in Wyoming um, that I, I saw and just did a brief on um, where there wasn't a place in town t for candidates to go where there was internet access and public television access you know, where it could be shown. So. But I think more importantly is that there's a real interest in doing debates at the state and local level. And we've seen um, small regional newspapers, um, local organizations do things where they are soliciting questions in advance from the public. And sometimes it's often putting up a Google survey form where it's go to this website, you know, and put in your question and please, you know, your voter information. Um, and if we're interested in, in you, you asking this, you know, we might ask you to come to the debate. Um, it could be done via social media. Um, it could be done via a Gmail address or a phone number. You know, we've seen, we've seen that as well. Um, so I think we're taken back by the number of smaller and regional debates that are looking to use that sort of engagement to involve the public. Um, but in terms of whether things that we've looked at, you know, can scale down in that way, um, I think Lily would be great to talk about that next. How are we doing on time? Okay, one more question. All right. Uh, this is a, a perfect segue to at State. We We've seen more interactive to our, our esteemed panel. A really interesting discussion. Uh, looking forward to seeing uh, how else these tools get used at, at the national level. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break. So if folks want to have some coffee, some we we have some uh, light bites out in the reception area. Do a bio break, and we'll be back in 10 minutes with our last panel. Thank you. <laughs>